go and get started here. And today, uh, like I mentioned before, we're going to be covering uh, 3D Via Composer uh, 2011 and 2011 X, uh, mostly focusing on the, uh, the X version. Uh, I'll give you a list of some of the highlights of what we're going to be covering here. Uh, it's actually a, a long shopping list of uh, quite a number of stuff that we've got uh, to cover. We'll cover as much as we can in the, uh, the time uh, allotted here for us today. We'll probably take this right up to 11. Uh, depending on time, we may run a little over or a little under, depending. Uh, but lots of stuff to, to cover. Uh, new formats, uh, hotspot improvements, uh, EPS output, uh, BOM stuff. Uh, some rendering effects that they've added, uh, the uh, configurable compass, uh, which is kind of a neat one, um, uh, quick quick access toolbars. Uh, some of these I've just have a slide for. Other ones I've actually have. Uh, we'll jump into the software after the slide and take a look at it and stuff. Uh, just so you can kind of see some of the, uh, the the things there. All right. So first slide take a look at it here. First thing I want to cover uh, real briefly is uh, how uh, Composer does the service packs. Um, oh, the other thing to point out before we cover service packs is one is the uh, 3D V is actually uh, like a product brand name uh, and then Composer is actually the uh, the, the program. Uh, so realistically it's Composer is, is the name not 3D Via. Reason being is Via actually produces several other uh, packages that you'll be seeing coming out uh, in the uh, the near future and there are some out that are uh, right now. So talking about the service packs, uh, there's two major releases each year, uh, each with their own uh, service packs. Uh, so for 2011 version, uh, there was a 2011 and 2011X. Within 11, there's a service pack 0, service pack 1, uh, and then within uh, 2011X, there's just a service pack zero that just came out. Uh, and I'll show you here in a moment in the software where you can actually find uh, what your service pack is. Uh, but it's kind of different than SOLIDWORKS. So if you're used to the SOLIDWORKS way of, of looking for uh, what the service pack is, it's kind of done a little differently. Uh, some of the other stuff, uh, you can download it uh, on the uh, login to SOLIDWORKS' website, customer portal page downloads and updates, 3D via Composer tab. So you'll see the SOLIDWORKS tab and a 3D via Composer tab. Uh, and then uh, typically, unless you're needing to install onto a machine that uh, has uh, or doesn't have SOLIDWORKS, you don't need to download the DVD content. DVD content is the OEM SOLIDWORKS and Composer. Typically, you would just need uh, 3D via Composer if you're already loading that on a machine. It's just for the translation stuff from SOLIDWORKS two different versions, 32-bit or 64-bit. Um, also, another thing to point out is um, uh, the licenses do update, uh, so you may need to get a new license file. So when you install it, there is a link uh, to request a license file, and then they'll generate a, another license file for you. Uh, last thing on this slide I want to point out is the fact that we actually have another website down here at the bottom. Um, and I'll leave that up a little bit longer, but uh, and we'll have this webcast uh, out on our archive, so you can pull that from there once we get that up there. Uh, but that is the uh, Composer Player and also the Network License Manager that you can download. Um, when you create a, uh, an HTML or a PDF, there is a hyperlink within those documents that goes to the same page as well. So let's go and switch over to Composer. And let's a, take a look at the uh, service pack version. So I'm going to go to the question mark in the upper right-hand corner here. And we'll go and come down to the About button there. Uh, so this particular one that I'm running is actually 2011X, uh, and then it's service pack 0, which they label as HF2. I think it's the, uh, the third release, so nothing, 1, and then 2. Uh, for the 11 series. So it's a little confusing, but essentially this is what you're looking for to make sure that you're on uh, the newer, newest version that's out right now. All right, going back to the slide here. Let's move on to the next one here. Don't want to waste any time. 
Uh, one of the biggest changes with 2011X um, is they've actually switched to a Unicode uh, character encoding. And the reason for that is uh, it allows you to actually create documents that could be translated from one language to another uh, version or another language version of, of uh, 3D via Composer quite easily. Um, but because of that though, any documents that were created in a previous version and then opened up in 2011X saved, they can no longer be opened in the, the old version, which they, by the way they were using a uh, multi-byte character uh, set there. So that, that particular thing, uh, or that's the old format. The other drawback to this big change uh, is the fact that the, uh, um, the player, um, anybody that currently has the player installed, they would also need to, to get into the 2011X player. Uh, as far as the HTMLs, SVGs, that type of thing, they'll still work in Internet Explorer, uh, PDFs, and Adobe Acrobat. So none of that is, has changed. It's just the, the player portion, or if you do a interactive version, um, so you do need to get the, the, the newer player. Uh, and I don't expect this to be like SOLIDWORKS, um, where every major release is not backwards compatible. This is just a one-time transition so that it's uh, multi-language support. So. But don't hold me to my word there. Uh, next item, new formats, supports the 2011 formats. It also is supports the new ASUS uh, release 21 format, so that's also there as well. Let's see, next slide. Um, starting into the meat of it here. Uh, instance names and SOLIDWORKS assemblies, that has changed. Uh, the, the fact that the instance uh, name used to always come in, now you have to actually specify that. Uh, so that does make one uh, important change. Uh, if you're going to use an existing, S existing SMG file that you created in Composer and you're wanting to do an update on it uh, in the new version, and I'll show you where this uh, checkbox is. Uh, it actually shows up in two places. Uh, but you want to turn that on. Otherwise, your existing stuff, you'll do an update, and then everything will turn off because of uh, different naming. Uh, so that is something to, to note for the, uh, uh, the new version. If you create new uh, SMG files from new CAD data, uh, then uh, you don't have to worry about turning that on. So they've essentially just pulled off the, the instance names. And again, better for grouping, so if you have a bunch of screws or something like that, you, you don't have instant one of screw one, instance two of screw one, so that's the other thing. Uh, let's see. What, you know what, let's go ahead and do that first one here. Let me jump over here. So, uh, just because it's a, a big one to, to play a role in, so if I wanted to do an update, I'd come into my file menu, come to update, composer document, uh, so here I could actually either update from a um, SMG file or a uh, SOLIDWORKS file, uh, but it's this uh, checkbox that I do need to turn on for that data to come in. So that is one thing that we do need to turn on. Uh, it does also show up in, uh, let's see, file and then down here to preferences. And let's see, we are looking at me here for a moment. I've forgotten where that's at. Oh, it might be document specific. My apologies. So I'm going to go uh, file menu again, properties, document properties. So these are the properties specific to that document. So we want to go input uh, right there. So that's where uh, it would show up. And that's specific to this SMG. So then case by case basis. Obviously that makes sense why it would be in here. But Make sure to turn that on or, or kind of play with that on or off and see what uh, works the best, especially if you're using existing stuff. All right, um, other stuff uh, they've added in the tech illustration, uh, layered rendering, so it actually uh, obeys the, the rendering layers. So if you have one thing on top of the other, that actually comes out in the vector output. Um, uh, SVG, uh, obviously is scalable vector graphics. The idea behind it is you can enlarge or shrink your, your vector graphics uh, so that uh, everything is crisp in and out uh, all the way uh, up and down there. Uh, next item, hidden lines, uh, styles for technical illustrations. 
Uh, this gives us the ability of actually doing uh, hidden stuff. Uh, so we can actually have our main model uh, primary, uh, and then we can actually hide whatever's behind it. So this is another item that they've done. And again, we're going to display rendering mode and then custom. So that has to be turned on first. Again, I'll show that on the screen here. Uh, so display mode, switch to a custom mode. Once we're into that custom mode, then we have the ability of grabbing an actor uh, and changing its uh, rendering style. So we could actually switch it to something else or we could even change it visible or not for what's forward and what's behind that. But we do have to be in that custom. So on to the next slide. Uh, this one I think is kind of a, a big one for me, uh, mainly because you can actually do uh, new hotspots for, or the, the hotspots actually show up really prominent, uh, a lot better than what it used to be. So if I hover over something, the whole part uh, highlights, so rather than just an outline or anything like that, that's done in the past there. Um, so that's one of the things that they've done, uh, and we'll get on to the next slide here uh, as well, but uh, I want do want to show that one uh, because that's a, another neat uh, effect that they've done. So I'm going to go and switch over to another uh, view here. Okay, so this is the, the, uh, the illustration view that I'm going to use. I'm going to switch over to my workshops. I'll go and go Tech Illustration Workshop. And one of the things I'll be getting to is the fact that there is a, uh, a preview now. So if I go and go preview, for a moment, it'll actually allow me to preview the SVG file. Bear with me here for a moment while I uh, move that onto the screen. So now if I come over the top of a model, you can see that it actually will highlight that entire item. Or if I come over one of the items in the bill of materials. So it's a little more interactive uh, and a little more catch your, your attention uh, than, uh, than what it used to be. Yep. All right, so let's get back to, we'll see, let's close out of that workshop there. So that's the hotspot there. Uh, silhouette generation uh, for vector output. Uh, there's actually several different modes that you can do. Uh, essentially, depending on uh, what you want uh, to come through, uh, in fact, let me open up a few SVG files here. All right, so there is a SVG that's done in the, the crest format. Okay, so you can kind of see where the, the gears and stuff that is. And again, I'm, I'm scaled really, really large here. Uh, the next one. This will be the model. Oh, I'm kind of jumping out of turn here. Now let's do the per actor one. So there's the per actor. So a little bit more faded. Some of the lines aren't showing up. For this one, you can really kind of see the prominence in it. It depends on what you're looking for. Maybe you do want this. Maybe you don't want that. And then let's go and do the last one here, the, the model. again, we have get even less there, especially like the tangent edges and that type of stuff that, that really start disappearing on us. Okay. All right, so, oh, and where that shows up. So if we go back to our tech illustration workshop, uh, we actually have the show silhouette method and then we have the three methods there. So this is one of the, the new items to switch to the different styling modes. Um, another good idea, I always bring my uh, outline width down a little bit, usually 0.5 or 0.25, so just so your lines don't look too, too thick there, but that's just a little side tip there. Uh, next topic, uh, creation of new hots, uh, custom hotspot areas. Uh, so what you can do is if you select one or more actor, and the actor could be um, a component actor, meaning like a part or, or a sub-assembly, uh, or we could also do um, uh, collaboration actors, arrows, text, that type of stuff, and we can actually turn a whole group of items into uh, a hotspot. Uh, so the way you go about doing that 
is we'll go and go over to our assembly tab. We'll go and pick out a few items that we have here uh, and say we want to make that a hotspot. So once those are highlighted, then we have our, our new uh, create a hotspot button there at the top. So we'll create that. Uh, and then it shows up down at the very bottom. So we've got selection sets and then we also have the hotspot set. Again, it takes you right into a uh, selection there. So now that becomes a hotspot area that you might want to link to, to something else. So I could actually come down while that hotspot is highlighted go and go link and I could link it to an external file if I wanted to or jump over to an ordering page if I wanted to. Uh, could You could just put in a, a straight HTML in here if you wanted to. All right, uh, let's see, where are we back at? All right, so custom hotspots. Uh, some of the other stuff with the tech illustration, we do have uh, APS uh, outputs now, uh, which is uh, good. A lot of people have been asking for that. Uh, EPS is a, a pretty widely used um, uh, publishing format, uh, so you can bring those into like Adobe Photoshop or um, uh, Publisher and a few other ones. Uh, encapsulated PostScript, so that's through the uh, tech illustration. It just shows up as a save as type. Uh, preview that I mentioned before, so that's uh, that's there as well uh, on the tech illustration pane, or workshop I should say. Uh, and then, um, let's see, uh, last one, dash scale uh, in SVG and EPS, so you can change the dash scale. Uh, so we, let's see, let's bring that up. So back to our tech illustration workshop again. I'll switch over to my options tab, uh, and then we can change our dash scale right there. Oh, I'm waiting for the uh, screen to catch up to me here. There we go. All right, so there's the uh, dash scale there. So we can actually change that. Okay. Apologize if I get ahead of you. <laughs> it's uh, sometimes it's uh, hard to, to see when the, the recording's catching up there. Let's see. Let's switch back to the PowerPoint. All right, next slide here. Uh, uniform uh, callout width. Uh, so now we can actually standardize our callouts uh, so that they all end up being the, the same size. So you can say within a, a certain size within each other, or you can make them all uniform. Uh, that shows up in your document properties, image quality, callout uh, width and uniform. Again, we'll bring that one up here. So file. Properties, document properties. Apologize, I've forgotten where that was at already. Um, image quality callout width. Uh, let's see, so image quality, callout width, and then if we wanted to do the uniform there, uh, if you leave this at zero, it leaves it all at the original, or you could set that to like two, so it would be within uh, a two points there of, of the font size. Okay. All right, so let's see where we left off at. Um, bomb ID for the root. Uh, so if you generate bomb IDs, you can actually have the, the top assembly uh, have a bomb ID. Sometimes you want that. Uh, so it shows up on the bill of materials, or sometimes you just want to sign a part number or something. You're using that as the bomb ID. Uh, next item is we've got uh, bomb table height, so it allows you to set the font size uh, just with a slider. Uh, so that's when you have your bomb highlighted, uh, you can make that change. Uh, this one, I don't know if it really constitutes being a, uh, a, a what's new, <laughs> but it is uh, something that they've pointed out is the fact that silhouette generation is faster now. Uh, this one's also kind of a good one for those that are doing SVG and the new EPS uh, for the vector formats. Um, it now uses uh, vector fonts, so it scales. So your fonts will actually uh, track a lot better when you uh, change the size of them. So if you're looking at them on a, a small like web uh, web page device uh, or uh, uh, or smaller screen, or if you're looking at a larger screen, it gives you a lot better uh, quality there. Uh, next item, high resolution uh, image workshop uh, does now have a preview as well. Uh, let me go ahead and jump over to that so you guys can see that. Uh, again, from my workshops tab, go 
one go high resolution and then I can go preview and as you can see it opens up into your default viewer program so for mine I just stuck with the Windows Photo Viewer if you had another default viewer for JPEG then uh, then it would do that as well so this is a, a great way of previewing images um, before actually producing uh, the final one so that's uh, a useful thing uh, again uh, just like SOLIDWORKS uh, 3D Via Composer uh, if you log into the SOLIDWORKS customer portal uh, under uh, enhancement requests uh, you can actually submit stuff uh, like if you're looking for something uh, and it's not available on the, the current version or the latest version then fill out an enhancement request so that's kind of where some of this stuff is coming from uh, so definitely take the time to, to fill out one of those the slides here uh, alpha channel uh, transparency in raster image uh, so raster images uh, meaning your high resolution workshop uh, you do have the ability of um, saving images files out with the alpha channel built in uh, so what it's using is based off of a 24-bit uh, regular color and then it adds an 8-bit alpha channel at the tail end of it and the reason for that is again for tech illustration kind of taking the composer stuff and moving it over to another uh, program like if you needed to, to embed a, uh, an image into a PowerPoint or something uh, or some other uh, drop in a different background or something if you turn on the the alpha channel and you save in a PNG TIFF or um, bitmap format then that alpha channel will come out JPEG obviously doesn't support alpha channels uh, it was mostly designed as a, uh, a web-based uh, uh, format getting into some of the high resolution stuff this is kind of a, a big big jump for them uh, they're actually adding a lot more realistic um, uh, type of shading and focusing and that type of thing for um, the high resolution stuff the higher resolution workshop um, the uh, the ability of doing ambient in inclusions I'll, I'll show that one on a, a model that I've got uh, and then we'll also uh, let's see for pixel lighting uh, we've got a I've got a quick example here where uh, if it's turned off it kind of fuzzes out the light uh, if we actually enable it we actually can get the the true reflection of the, the light off the object so depending on what look you're going for uh, the other thing is the depth of field you can actually tell it to focus on a specific point uh, and and blur everything out behind it so that might kind of draw the focus to a certain area opposed to somewhere else um, side note uh, they did change the anti-aliasing uh, button to high quality that's the rebuild button essentially uh, the the regeneration button uh, just to to update the the image that's on the screen so that's now called uh, high quality uh, but let's go back to composer here again and let's uh, switch out uh, our model here let's see let's close that one out all right so uh, well, all these models I'm getting off of 3D Content Central, so I just throw up whoever I, I got them from, but uh, I go to 3D Content Central. Uh, this, I think, was uh, a search for bike, and this is what came up. Um, let's see, before we go into uh, the ambient in inclusions, uh, I do want to bring up the uh, PDF. Uh, that well one where I'm getting all this information and also where it's listing the system requirements uh, they're recommending uh, at least two gigs of RAM uh, and a, a dual core processor for uh, composer uh, you could get away with something a little slower and smaller but again uh, machines do tend to, to progress forward uh, they're saying 1080 by 1024 I would recommend going larger than that because I'm actually running that for this webcast but it's it's a little difficult because some of the uh, the images don't quite fit on there so larger screen obviously you would want to get better um, this is what I wanted to point out um, the OpenGL 3.2 your video card needs to be able to support that uh, to be able to get to the ambient exclusions the, the point of light and then also the field of depth. If you don't have the ability of uh, supporting the newer OpenGL format, then you won't be able to get to that. Okay. Uh, where I got to this document is the release notes. 
where I'm getting all my information from. Go up to the help, uh, and then it's the release notes there. So if you need a review of stuff that I went through today, uh, that's where I uh, got the information from there. So ambient exclusions. Uh, the main setting shows up in our preferences. And I go down to hardware support. Uh, we do need to make sure that enable OpenGL display list. Um, I do usually like to push this up to a high quality, but I've done some tweaking so it switches to a custom. Switching over to viewport. Uh, this is where we have the ability of allowing it or not allowing it. So typically I would say use document settings, that way it doesn't turn it on for everything. Uh, but you could uh, set it to enable it for all, all items. And then when you want it to do it, on demand, real time, that type of thing. Again, depending on the speed of the machine. Uh, per pixel lighting, turn that one to use document. And then again, depth of field, same, same basic idea. So those uh, have to be turned on here, or at least set in some manner, uh, enabled or document settings for it to, to be allowed. Okay. And then we'll go into our document. So if I click on the background, just to make it the active actor, because the background is an actor, uh, we scroll down to the bottom, and then you'll see the ambient uh, occlusions. Uh, so if I turn that on, uh, you can kind of see the transition uh, looks a little more realistically. Uh, I am going to zoom in here so we can see a close-up, and it does make a big difference when we're a little bit closer here. So if I zoom in on a, a different view, then I go and go Enable. So it gives us a really good uh, uh, image quality there, uh, a lot better than, than what it was. Again, with and without. Uh, the point of light... Yeah, sometimes you can kind of see the transition there depending on what you're looking for for the, the look there. Do you want it to reflect or not to reflect? All right, back to the PowerPoint here. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, properties in tooltip and uh, collaboration text, uh, you can allow uh, now include multiple actor properties so we can actually group things together. Uh, so we can actually drop a whole bunch of information. We can also link information into uh, that particular node as well, too. So we can actually bring that stuff information. Um, I believe the help file would be a good resource to actually pull in what those dollar sign values would be. And again, that's, that's these things right here. Uh, select uh, actors with broken associations. That's mostly if it's essentially gotten disconnected from something you can right click over in the collaboration pane and, and reassociate it. Um, that's just more of a troubleshooting type step anyways. So this one is I think a, a really neat added option here. Uh, the configur configurable compass and I'll show this in, in the model here but it actually makes the compass now uh, an actor. The compass being uh, the object in the uh, or the controls in the upper right corner of the graphics here. And this comes out onto your 3D models or 3D interactive uh, player uh, SMG files that you might be sending out. Um, the idea behind it is if we have a mechanism that's inside a, an entire larger mechanism or, or a larger structure, then we can illustrate the orientation of that particular device. So we've actually switched out the compass into a, a, a helicopter to indicate, okay, this is the orientation of up, down, left, and right for for that particular. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that here. Um, oh, side note, turn off sensitivity just so that uh, you don't switch the orientation by accident. All right, so let's go and open up a, another model here. So let's go and grab. Let's go and grab that one. Bear with me here while the model switches out. And I'm just going to go to something that's uh, more of an internal view. Okay. 
All right, so there's our compass in the upper right corner. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll switch over to my collaboration tab, come down to my environment, and then I'll go and highlight my compass. And then I get the properties for that compass. So if I highlight that, I'll actually get all the um, properties specifically to that. Uh, I do recommend actually moving uh, the compass um, into place first before you switch it out with the um, let's see it specifically needs to be um, uh, SMG geometry uh, the way you create an SMG geometry is you you uh, would actually save out a project file so file save as composer and you would save this as an, a project and what that does let's see let's open up open up so you, you get the project file but then you get the subfolder within that subfolder you actually get the other and I'll have to open that up in a separate window here you'll actually get the separate geometry scenes views XMLs all the other specifics also you get a thumbnails of the the, uh, uh, the views there as well uh, but so for the compass we need that SMG geometry All right, so I get the compass into view. I go and select in my path. I go and click on the uh, the dot 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 or the ellipses button. Okay. It opens up my dialog, and I'll go and go into and find my SMG uh, geometry file. Okay. Open that up. Wait for it to load. So now this compass is actually uh, relative to the orientation of this model. Okay. I'm going to switch out of uh, design mode here, so I turn that off, uh, and then I'll go and rotate my model. And notice how my compass actually tracks with the model itself. So if I took this and saved the SMG or sent the SMG to somebody else, or if I created an HTML, an uh, interactive HTML, uh, that compass would actually now track with uh, the whole model. So I think that's kind of a really new, neat feature for them to, to, to add. So moving on here, uh, looks like we're doing okay on time so far, so that's good. Um, copy transformation between two geometry actors. Um, for me, I thought they had this in there prior, but I guess I've been using 2011X for a while at this point, but it's between two geometry actors. Uh, so essentially, if they wanted to align the, uh, the blue box, they can actually pick an edge or a face on one on the, uh, the pink box and then they can also pick a, an edge or a face on the, the green box and then have it align based off of those those particular items. So it's just the expanding the, the alignment uh, capability. So if you move one part and you need the other one to come with it, that's what that's for. The uh, next item, texture projection camera, or set texture, well, it's the ability of putting a texture on a face and then depending on how your camera is oriented your texture will actually rotate with you um, so again it's on the the textures workshop I don't have a, a good example of that but uh, I'll go and bring up that texture workshop so textures or workshops and then textures oh, I do need to get out of design or back into design mode here uh, so if I go to the last one down here, uh, it'll actually give us a uh, uh, the ability of based off of the camera view there. And I grab out my image and apply that on there. Okay. Uh, last item is uh, copy appearance properties. So we now have a an eyedropper, uh, so we can copy if, uh, items from one item to another. Uh, that one's a, a quick one to show here as well. Let's go back up to the uh, the main uh, view here of the model. Let's save. Oh, when I was doing the ambient inclusions, I didn't point this out. That uh, high quality or that regenerate button, uh, Control J for a short key. But if you click on that button, it'll actually go through and re regenerate or re uh, uh, do some additional calculations on the model. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer for it to, to come up, but. Oh, I also have focus at a, a particular point turned on too. So, but uh, that's what it showed down here at the bottom. 
But if I turned on ambient exclusions and then I go high quality, it'll ask for a focus point. So I'll give it maybe a point up here. Uh, and then it kind of fuzzes everything out in the back there. Uh, but anyways, back to the, the property stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select an actor here. And uh, I'll actually copy the, um, let's see, I want to actually, my mistake, I want to select the, the one I want to copy it to. Select the eyedropper and then pick the one I want to copy it and then you'll see that it copied all that information over to that particular model so it, or that particular uh, actor. So that I think is a, a real big help for getting everything to, to look the same. You don't have to go through set up the colors and, and all that information every single time. So I'll carry that, uh, that information over. Okay, ah, there we go. Color, opacity, shininess, emissions, that type of stuff. So that's what that eyedropper is for. Let's see, next slide. 64-bit uh, uh, version of 3D Via Composer now supports the uh, uh, Kinetics um, space files uh, and also some of the other 3D Kinetics uh, devices. Uh, make sure you uh, go out to their website, the uh, 3D uh, Kinetics um, uh, website and grab a new driver. Uh, version list. Uh, most of you probably aren't aware of this, but you can actually tell it, tell Composer what program to do the converting with. The reason you want to do that is so that it doesn't take your 010 file, SolidWorks files, and update them to 11 when you didn't want it to do that. Um, I'm trying to point where that's at here. So we're going to go into um, File, go down to Preferences, and bring that back onto the screen here. with me here for a moment. Ah, there we go. Okay, so input. Uh, this list now only shows what you have loaded on the machine. So you can see that I only have 11 loaded, so it's only going to use 11. But if I had 10, 7, 10, 11, then you could pick out the specific one that you want to do the translation so that you don't accidentally update the engineer's models uh, on, on them by accident. Alright, back to our PowerPoint. Um, oh, new minimize. Uh, so there is actually a minimize button for the ribbon. Uh, I'll show that here in a moment. Uh, and then also we can add an additional quick access toolbar. So that's that bar going across the top edge there. So we're going to show both of those here as well. Uh, so the minimize is kind of useful if you need to get more uh, real estate there or more graphics area. Uh, you can actually um, uh, branch that up uh, just by that little arrow pointing it up or down there. Um, I also want to point out that uh, if we unpin the uh, uh, the bar there, it actually will collapse down. Let's unpin that as well. There we go. Uh, so then we get little buttons uh, over on the right for the different tabs. So this is kind of another way of um, maximizing your, your graphics area uh, just by unpinning those. Uh, if we want them back, uh, we can go and pin those out again. And we'll go and pin that as well. Uh, same thing with the workshops too. So if I go high resolution, uh, if I go unpin that, it collapses down just to a single tab there. Okay. If I pin it, it comes back out. So all depending on what you're wanting to do for regaining real estate on your your desktop there. All right. So that was the the one. If I want to add more stuff up here across the top, so if there's common things I want to use all the time, I hit the down arrow. I go more commands. Uh, and then I can actually go through and I can find uh, the commands that I'm going to be using all the time. So if I want to go, well, let's see, that's popular. Let's go all commands here. Uh, so I could actually scroll through and find whatever specific function I want. So if I want to create a grid, add that, and go on OK, then I have the ability of getting to that create grid real quickly. So that's the way we'll, we're going to go with the, the customization there. Okay. All right. I think that's following the Microsoft uh, uh, Office packages, the 2007 and 2010. They also have that ability of customizing that ribbon across the top there. Uh, some other stuff here, uh, thumbnails uh, for attaching shape properties. Uh, well, the little thumbnails there on the, the right kind of uh, show that if you have a, uh, um, you can actually attach things with different uh, attach points 
so different shapes and that type of thing so that's uh, something new uh, media editing mode of 2d text panel so this is more of a convenience thing so if I do a 2d text panel and I want to start typing it right away I can uh, in the previous versions you had to drop it hit the escape key or turn off the 2d text panel and then go into it and start typing it so this is uh, just a faster way of, of getting into typing in your, your tags and labels and stuff uh, selection sets a uh, little bit easier to create those sets uh, nothing really unique to it uh, ground mirror enhancements uh, when you go into a custom render mode you can actually kind of change the uh, uh, the mirroring of the model and the, the background a little bit better so you could actually have it uh, pull in the uh, the background or not Let's see if I can get that one to, to come up here all right so I'm gonna go display I'm gonna turn on my my ground there and I'll go and go custom and let's see collaboration so I'll go and grab my ground okay. so while the ground selected I can actually go mirror so you can see the mirror there. I can also change the intensity of the reflection. So if I want it to be real crisp or not, uh, or I could have it real fuzzy. Uh, do I want it blurred? Actually, let's go right there. So you can almost get a, an exact mirror showing up on the uh, on the bottom there. So if you have a part that you want to show detail on the underside, that might be a good option to, to turn that, that mirroring on. Okay. And blur or no blur. Moving on, um, let's see. Oh, uh, for those that do batch, uh, the old DOS batch files and stuff, uh, there is a, uh, a better format for doing uh, uh, command line generation of images. Um, help file goes into this a little bit more, but you can actually use a command line uh, to actually create an image. It tells it the SMG file, it tells it which uh, XML file to, to look at. Uh, and then you can have it kind of run that stuff in the background. It's kind of like a, a, a self-made uh, API or a self-made um, um, 3D via composer sync enterprise, essentially. But that's only if you need to, to automate that type of stuff. Uh, license information. Uh, if your license was generated uh, after uh, July 10th of, or July 2010, then... Uh, you can actually borrow the license up to 30 days for a network license uh, and previous to that it was only seven days so that's just something there uh, some of the other uh, fine stuff fine-tuned stuff here for the uh, the 2011 X version uh, is we have uh, some property names that change uh, so rather than uh, it used to be called uh, label link property didn't make a whole lot of sense it's the tooltip uh, and the tooltip string or the, the, the information contained within that tooltip. The other thing is uh, if you have a, a balloon uh, or a callout and you've got, it used to be linked parent level, now it's just parent level text. So it's gotten a lot easier and then the text string. So, uh, so they've kind of changed some stuff around to make it a little bit easier to understand. All right, so that was all um, 2011X. Uh, we've got a little bit that we'll cover with 2011, uh, just some quick highlights and that type of stuff, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this up here. All right, uh, assembly colors. Um, just like in SOLIDWORKS or other CAD packages, uh, there is a hierarchy uh, for the, the colors. Uh, so if, and the, the illustration here is if you have no colors at the top or the bottom, then the children take on uh, whatever original color they are. Uh, if you color one of the sub-assemblies, then those children become that part. But if you color something in the top-level assembly, then the children become that particular color. So there is a hierarchy now. Uh, and this also carries into the 2011X. Uh, update existing views with scene changes. So these all came in. Uh, those show up. Uh, if I have a, an actor selected, I go to my view, I can actually right click and I do update views with selected actors and, and, and so on and so forth. Same thing with scenes and that type of thing. So it's a, a great way of updating a bunch of views uh, just by selecting an actor, selecting the views, uh, and then doing the update there. Save you some time there. 
uh, hatching uh, can be per actor now, so you can actually make the separation between two different parts a lot easier. So that's uh, something that's also new. Uh, linked, uh, linking views. This one's actually a, a worthwhile one to show. I'll also show the magnetic lines one here as well. And actually even the paper space one. I'll go and show, uh, show all three of those here. Alright, so the link views, essentially it's these little thumbnails. So what I want to do is if I go back up to my parent view, or my master view, and say I wanted to link uh, from that master view over to this other, all I have to do is do a single left click to highlight it, hold my control key down on my keyboard, drag that over onto the, um, onto the uh, paper there, uh, and now that is a linked view or a linked actor. So if I highlight that and scroll down, you'll see that it's actually linked to that specific view name. Okay. So what that means is if I come into uh, regular mode, so I turn off design mode, so now that becomes a hotspot. So I can click on that, and it'll actually take me, let's see, let's go and update that view. Uh, it takes me to that particular view. And then we have another one here that takes me back to the original. So I click on that, and it'll jump me back to the original view. You could do this in the previous uh, to 2011 version, but it's a lot easier and a lot, uh, lot um, more convenient to, to do it this way. Uh, let's see, what was the, the next item there? Oh, magnetic lines. Yeah, that one's actually a fun one. Let's uh, let me open up my gearbox here again. Bear with me here. There we go. All right, so what magnetic lines are? Shows up on your author tab, I grab magnetic, uh, and then I just drop in a, a line. I'll go and hit my escape there, okay? Turn it off or click on it again to turn it off. But now this, uh, this magnetic line, if I drag it over, uh, it'll actually allow me to pick up and get it to take. Now, well, there must be something I'm, oh, they're not set to, to free movement. Uh, let's see, there we go. And you know what? let's go and grab all those and some to free. Bear with me here for a moment. So I select all those. I don't want left and right. I want to do 2D free. There we go. All right, so now with those on there, I drag this over, and it'll actually allow me to snap those onto that magnetic line. Change the order if I need to. Yeah, it looks like I missed a few, but, but the advantage is now those actually track with that magnetic line, so I can actually reposition them real quickly. Okay. So that's the magnetic lines. Uh, let's see, and the last one on that sheet was, oh, let's see, I got ahead of myself here. There we go, paper space. Oh, yeah, this one's actually uh, good to know. Uh, you can zoom in and out of the paper uh, just by doing the little plus sign down here in the lower right. Uh, or you can also do a control, hold control down and then scroll with your mouse and it'll allow you to zoom in and out of the paper. And again, you need to make sure that you have your paper turned on. So if you don't have that turned on, you end up with a view like that. Turn that on and then the view uh, uh, will come in there. And again, control scroll, just like web pages too. Most web browsers, you can do a control scroll to zoom in and out as well. So next slide, okay, uh, blurring mirror. Okay, so we talked about that real quick for the ground. Uh, we kind of saw that already. Uh, workshops, uh, DPI uh, control uh, within the high resolution workshop, so that, that was added. Uh, simplified uh, bomb IDs, uh, so it's a lot easier to, to add the bomb IDs in the 2011 and 2011X. Um, Tech illustrations, uh, large 2D panels are now vectorized, so if you actually do a panel in the background, uh, it'll also get vectorized as well, uh, depending what method you use to, to put it in with, obviously. Um, gizmos and compasses, they did change the look of some of that stuff, so there's not a whole lot going there, uh, but they did change that, that look there. Okay, and that is it. So we actually finished a uh, little head of schedule there.